Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. My name is Travis Fortney, and I'm an adult services librarian at the Willoughby Public Library, and we're coming to you live from Lake County, Ohio, and I believe uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Geauga County, Ohio. So there you go. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk to Lisa Scottolini about her new novel, Eternal. A reminder to everyone, you can keep up with Between the Lines events by checking on the library's Facebook page or the library events calendar at we247.org. We've got great events coming up with Lynn Cahoon, John McWhorter, Willie, Va Willie Vlaughton, Jess Walter, and more. Uh, tonight, I'm extremely excited to welcome Lisa Scottolini to Between the Lines. Lisa needs no introduction. She's the number one best-selling Edgar Award-winning author of 33 novels. She has more than 30 million copies in print and has, pub and has been published in 35 countries. If you're here, you're probably a fan of her best-selling thrillers. Eternal is something of a departure. Her first foray into historical fiction, a sweeping World War II epic set in Rome, the Eternal City, that's been called her masterpiece. So if that's not enough, Lisa also writes a weekly column with her daughter, Francesca Saratella, which have been adapted into a series of best-selling memoirs. And on top of it all, it's fair to say that Lisa is a bona fide pet enthusiast. So we'll be talking about that tonight too. Uh, we've got a lot of people participating tonight, both over Facebook and Zoom. And I've got questions for Lisa written down. And I've also got questions from my coworkers, Brian, Amanda, and Carol. But my hope is that those of you watching will take over the discussion by asking lots of questions. To ask Lisa something, just type your question in chat on Zoom or as a comment on Facebook. And we'll ask Lisa your question. <clears throat> um, before we start tonight, I want to tell you all a story about how tonight's program came to be. Uh, like all great stories, this one starts in a library. Our protagonist is Carol Tuttle, my coworker, who read an advanced copy of Eternal a few months ago and nominated the book for the March Library Reads, which is a monthly nationwide, nationwide library staff picks list. Carol's review was published and Eternal was named a library reads pick. And Lisa noticed and very enthusiastically shouted out Carol on Facebook. Then I enthusiastically emailed Lisa and arranged the program. Well, Carol is here with me helping out behind the scenes tonight. And before we get started, she's gonna say a few words. Well, well, first off, Lisa, I'm gonna shake your hand through the screen. I am so thrilled to have the chance to meet you. Uh, your support of libraries and book clubs is legendary. And I have to say, when I received the advanced reader copy of Eternal, I think it was last December, I realized I'd never read a book by Lisa Scottolini. And since I'm really a literary fiction and historical fiction fan, and, and there were too many books on my to be read pile, I never slipped one of your legal thrillers in there but eternal, I picked that thing up when it came in the mail and I said, this looks like a book I could love and I loved it. And the book is riveting and a joy to read and has so much to teach us. And anyone watching tonight who's part of a book club will definitely wanna put eternal on their list of 2021 titles. Um, I just am overjoyed that you joined us this evening and thank you for sharing your time with us. <laughs> thank you. Carol, I couldn't be happier and more honored. And let me just give my counterpart to that story because um, this was is a bit of a departure for me and it's kind of the book of my heart in a lot of ways. And it's we can talk about that. But so when you send something like that into the world, even after 33 books and eight memoirs that are kind of like, I like to think of Zerma Bombeck, a daughter of Ohio, um, I, I, I prayed. Like, I was like, oh, what's gonna happen? And Carol's review was among the first that came in. And as a, I love libraries so much. And we can talk about that later too. But I owe my, my lifelong love of reading to libraries. And what they do for us is immeasurable. And that's why I will do anything, any library asset, and anywhere. So when that, when that review came in and it was good, well, of course, I started crying. And I will try not to cry now. And then I said, you have to find her. And so I started like looking around. And I knew I was going to accost you online. And Carol, just thank you so much. Because it means so much. I know how much you, you read. I know how much you do. And when this book made started with your review, when this book made library reads list for the first time ever in my career, 
Um, oh. It was just so gratifying. I was just so thrilled. So thank you so, so much for that. Well, I'm definitely a Lisa Scottolini fan now. So oh, well, I'm a Carol Scottolini fan. I'm following fan, so you on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to duck out and I will help let some more people in from the waiting room. Thank you thank again you, so Carol. much. For the <laughs> thank you, Carol. Thank you. All right. Um, so, so to start, uh, are you ready to read a little section of the book? Do you, do you have a little? I do. Oh no, where's? Oh no, no. Hold on. I have to jump up. <laughs> but happily for all of us, you got to see that I was wearing pants, real pants. <laughs> it's actually like not just elastic at the top. I will read briefly because I want to leave time for questions and such. Yeah, and sounds good. I don't want to bore you, but I will read the prologue, which is a. Uh, well, I don't know how long to go. You already think. Okay, it's only a page. Elisabetta. Elisabetta had kept the secret for 13 years, but it was time to tell her son who his father was. I won't make face. She had been waiting <laughs> until he was old enough, but she didn't want to delay any longer. He deserved to know the truth, and she had never been comfortable keeping it from him. The secret had grown, grown harder to keep over time, like a bag of groceries carry the first block, then the second, but by the third must be set down. She stood at the kitchen sink, finishing her coffee, and the apartment was quiet and still as her son was out playing soccer. She prepared herself for the conversation, realizing she would have to relive the worst days of her life and even of her country's history, since her youth had encompassed the Ventennio, the 20 years of Mussolini's rule and a war that had turned Italy topsy-turvy during which good became bad and bad became powerful. I'll read two more paragraphs. Tears filmed Elisabetta's eyes, but she blinked them away. She hoped she could make her son understand why she hadn't told him. The revelation would shock him, he suspected nothing, resembling her so strongly that it was as if her father's, uh, uh, it was as if his father's biology expressed itself in his personality rather than his facial features. Her gaze strayed over the sink. She eyed a, grew in, a view ingrained in her memory from Chesteveré to Vatican City, a palimpsest unique to Rome, which had been adding to itself since the beginning of Western civilization, layer upon layer of travertine marble, brick arches, medieval turrets with crenellations, and the red tiled roofs of houses with facades of amber and ochre. Church stones dotted the timeless scene, interspersed with palm trees, cypresses, and umbrella pines. Soaring above them all was St. Peter's Basilica, its iconic dome gilded by the Italian sun. Elisabetta withdrew from her reverie and set her coffee cup in the sink. Her son would be home any minute. The kitchen filled with the aroma of lasagna, his favorite meal. He had made it because he was going to hear a difficult story, but one he needed to know one she needed to tell. She heard the door open and he entered the apartment, dropping his soccer ball. She braced herself. Ciao, amore. Mama, are we having lasagna? Yes, come into the kitchen. Would you? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Thank you, that was great. Such a, it's, it's kind of a, the prologue and epilogue, I guess, are kind of bookends of the, it and it's uh, such a long journey from the, I don't know, from the beginning to the end, but. Right, it's 20 um, years, hopefully, you know, I think it reads quickly though. As a thriller writer, I said, you have to write historical fiction that reads at the pace of a thriller. Then I felt like there is so much drama in the story, not only from the story of the three people who are fictional and their families, but also of the times. It was such a turbulent time in Italy's history and in world history. And to sort of condense it made everything move really, really fast. So I was really kind of thrilled. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just got the book last week from your publisher. And, I, and when I opened up the envelope, I was like, oh boy, how am I going to read this by the, you know, by the event a week from today? And then I opened the cover and then 24 hours later so right. I closed it you know that was I right. mean it's you know just just read like a rocket so well, thank you for that a lot of, a lot of fun I, I really um, wanted look it's a it's an important there's and we'll talk about it but there's the story has a substance to it that draws on a real life event that is kind of shocking that isn't more well known and so yeah. when you're talking about something that has such gravity you have to um 
speak to it with the seriousness that it deserves. So, yeah. so for, first question, just sure. just to start off, uh, what, why, why now? Why make your first attempt at historical fiction after writing thirty three books and enjoying, you know, career as probably one of the most I don't know popular and revered thriller writers out there. Well, why, I, why, why make the switch or, or, or is it a switch? You know, well, that's a really good question. And I'm going to have to, honestly, I don't think it's that much of a switch though. Yeah. Cause right. I mean, bookstores and library, people need to classify things somehow, but I've learned about this story um, in a, from an English class that I took at Penn when I was an undergraduate there with Philip Roth, which was amazing. And he sort of introduced us to the work of Primo Levi an Italian chemist who was eventually captured by the Nazis, but survived. And I was like, gee, I'm Italian American. I should really know this part of Italian history. And the more I read about it and the more I researched it over 40 years, Travis, you weren't even born. You were a little baby. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna write about this someday. But I knew that um, it's a very complex story. All novels have their own issues. But a thriller is a uh, will take place over maybe several days, um, or this is a novel that takes over twenty years, and it's going to. Yeah. If I've written about law and justice before, and families before, and how they intersect with these issues, mm -hmm. this is just that writ large. So I had a little bit of a sense that it was bigger. I never really thought of it as different, but whatever people want to say, it's different, bigger, whatever. All I know is. I felt as if it took everything I had learned in 30 years of job training, like on the job, yeah, okay, to bring that all to bear. Like I was like, girl, you got to bring all your stuff, like your, all of your superpowers, because this is going to take it. And also, that's, that's what it reads like, honestly. It, re it reads, what, it reads like you've been practicing for 30 years and you're, and you're using it all. I think so. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So... I want I want to ask you a, I want to ask you a question that'll be a that, that might catch you off guard but uh, so so in the in the promotional materials they're you know they're calling uh they're calling eternal your masterpiece and what I'm wondering is do you think of the book that way and well, for I you what that, is what so does that mean I wrote the promotional materials I <laughs> oh you wrote them <laughs> <laughs> no one of the you said that and I said that's a good thing to say I'm no dummy <laughs> um no, I forgot the question. I was joking around about it. Do I agree? Oh, do, well, do you think of the book that way? And what is a masterpiece? I think, um, yeah, I kind of do. I kind of do think. Yeah. I think it's a magnum opus. I think it's everything you've learned now, it's your final exam. And that isn't to take yeah. away anything from before. I mean, listen, a basic thriller with a murder that has to be solved and figured out in real time. I mean, everything I've written requires research. I was a lawyer, so I know the law, the law is real, the forensics are real. I usually set them in real places somewhere in Philadelphia. There are rules to be uh, abided. And so yeah. nothing yeah. is ever easy. <laughs> no novel's ever easy, but this one required so much more because it was about three families. Like it's not just three main characters, this love yeah. triangle take place in Rome. It's really three families. It's the generation. And I was glad to read at the beginning, even though I kind of screwed up in parts, because when I remember being in Rome and researching it and that word palimpsest came to my mind, which was like a vocab word that, you know, like I learned for the SAT and never used in my life. And I was like, that's what they mean. Because a palimpsest was when, like the monks would in medieval days would write on a manuscript and then over time when they write it, write something else, they would wipe it away because it was on mm -hmm. parchment. So they couldn't just throw it away. So they wipe it away and then they, um, but it wouldn't really disappear. So palimpsest came to mean the layers of time made visible. And when mm -hmm. I was happened to be sitting in Rome eating a pizza, um, and I looked at on this like different array of architecture and there was a, an arch from the Roman times and something from the 1800s and the crenellated turrets and all the things I described. And I said, you know, it's very interesting. That is a palimpsest, but also the more, most graphic definition of a palimpsest is generations of a family. Yeah. And so 
that is really use that use family equals history and history being the stories of family <laughs> over time so that's really what i wanted to do yeah i love that uh that that scene in the book where i think marco is is he, he's walking somewhere in rome and he really feels the i can't remember exactly where what building he's yes. he's in but yes. but but he really feels the history around him and then he then he goes and gives that speech in the in the uh and it un, un, has the unfortunate effect of uh you know a, a, uh, accelerating his career in fascism i guess well, but <laughs> but wait a minute, because they, what this is is a love triangle set in, in in fascist italy so there's a young girl elisabetta and she has three best friends who are two best friends who are guys one is marco who's kind of this really athletic and robust and but I don't know why everything is so loud in my kitchen. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, ro robust kind of guy. He's a cyclist. And his best friend is Sandra, who's more thoughtful and kind of a math genius. And so Marco feels so, um, he kind of feels very inferior because he has a secret. And his secret is that he can't read. Now, the modern reader will know that he has dyslexia. But I had to research what was what dyslexia like in 1930s Rome. And yeah. it wasn't... Um, it was very, very, obviously it's a nascent education about it. So he just feels stupid. So what happens to him is you have to sort of look at, they're all fascists at the beginning of the book because you had to be, but understand why does fascism appeal to him? And it's partly because it speaks to his insecurity. So that one yeah. night I'm explaining the, just for the for readers, and this isn't a spoiler because I want to be careful not to give any away. But one night he's traveling around Rome on a bicycle. And that's interesting because Mussolini, what he did as a mat, as an intentional matter was redo the map of Rome. He actually replanned Rome and excavated a lot of the ruins and moved the roads so that you would drive past them and so you would see them. So they became visible in a way they hadn't been before. And it became a source of pride for someone like Marco, who, and he ends up going into this excavation pit, which I could use the photos from of the day that he could do. And he realizes, I'm not nobody. I'm a son of Rome. And that is really, really special. And so fascism for him speaks to his self-worth. You know, when yeah. I started study this, right? And I looked at why does Mussolini succeed? So many of the, the armchair BSE kind of stuff said he made the trains run on time. But that isn't what did it, in my view. Um, and I'm only an amateur historian, but I did consult one. It was much stronger than that. It was, he got a cult-like following because he spoke to the real needs of the people, the need for them to feel pride, the ultra-nationalism. And at the same time, that was the carrot, but at the same time, the stick was you'll join us because you have to and we'll propagandize and we'll make radios really cheap so you can hear my speeches and we'll censor the newspapers and we'll beat you up if you don't join. So it was really a, a, a two-handed approach, but certainly that's the long explanation of, of what we're talking about. What was the appeal of fascism to everyday people? What's interesting is I can just add the Italy was so unique, and that was another reason why I wanted to write about it, because it really is called the Forgotten Front in World War II. And what hmm. happened during Italian fascism is so interesting, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, because Italian fascism didn't even start out um, anti-Semitic. Italian Jews were very assimilated into society. There was a 50% intermarriage rate. The mayor of Rome was Jewish. So that when when it did anti-Semitism didn't really come in fascism until Mussolini decides to join with Hitler, which he went back and forth about. And so then these barrage of anti-Semitic laws are enacted and I kind of show the effect of those. And that set up the Jews of Rome for the Nazis eventual occupation. But it was so fascinating to me that I'll shut up because everybody knows that Rome is the source of the seat of Roman Catholicism and St. Peter's is right there. But I learned in my research that the Roman Jewish community, which is in the ghetto, the so-called ghetto, is the oldest continuously existing Jewish community in Western civilization. Hmm. Right? That is a mind-blowing fact. And the juxtaposition of those two facts and what happens to the confluence of those things as the 1930s increase and fascism looms and then explodes is really, really fascinating as a backdrop. And so I used it in a journal.
Some, something I'm interested in the book, and I'm kind of getting off track on my questions here, but, uh, but uh, is that all, it seems like all the characters, you know, they, I mean, well, not all of them, but, but a good number of them start out as fascists in the book. And then they all, um, you know, kind of midway through, I don't want to give away spoilers either, but, <laughs> but they all have separate enough is enough moments with the fascism and they, you know, and they turn against it, I guess. Um, and I, I was, and I'm, you know, you, you got to think about this stuff in, in the parallels of today, I guess, or the, you know, and our, and I'm wondering, you know, do you think those, those moments where people change their views have to be personal or does that, does that make sense? I mean, it does. I mean, I think what happens in the book and we'll leave to people who read it, what they take from it, because it's not about today. It's really about what happened then. No. Yeah. It's, but but I mean, as you say, it's so important. Look, history. Uh, what is it? Faulkner says history. What's past is prologue. What's past isn't even past. And I've written all throughout my career. A lot of my legal thrillers and domestic thrillers are about where law doesn't lead to justice and how that change, how the concept of justice changes over time. How just, how the parameters of justice change over wartime. For example, I've written a novel like Killer Smile. This is a novel about how Italian Americans were uh, interned during World War II, how Japanese Americans were interned during World War II and German Americans were. Um, my own grandparents registered as enemy aliens under laws that existed at that time. While at the same time, my own father was fighting, of course, for the United States in the US Army Air Force. We, Korematsu is a Supreme Court decision that said that was all lawful uh, and constitutional. Frankly, it wasn't, it was wrong and we know better. But what happens when you think big picture is that if you don't know history, it really does repeat itself. And that our concept of what is lawful and what is just varies according to how safe we feel. And so that'll always be a struggle. And when you tell a story like I'm telling of Eternal, which took place in a very specific place in time, and I've wanted to write this book for 40 years, so that's what it's about. But people can draw their own conclusion yeah. about what, what applies today, and they will. I invite them to. I won't tell them what to think. But I, I have an obligation to tell it true, especially because with respect to this event that we won't give anything away, but there's a true life event that happened in Rome in October 43 that I have been to Rome many times. I was actually taken there by my Italian publisher for the food. Like they're like, eat the artichokes, they're great. And so much of that's great about Italy is the food. And that was also an important aspect of Eternal. You know, you want to go to Italy and you're going to feel like you're in Italy and walking through those charming streets of Trastevere and eating the delicious foods and looking at the beautiful architecture. But I have that there only because you can see how much that changes over time. So that when fascism takes hold and then World War II takes over, food is rationed. And yeah. then when the Nazis come in, right? They, they weaponize food. They try to starve the Jews. And part of the reason that Italy surrendered is because it was so thoroughly bombed, devastatingly bombed in the South that the wheat fields could no longer produce pot, flour for pasta. And they starved. I mean, they didn't think this was gonna happen in this war. And that's when they abandoned the effort. It was a yeah. really part of the story. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your personal connection to Italy and Rome. I, you, you said you're Italian American, but did you, I mean, did you have family in Italy during World War II and are there family stories from that time? Yes, I have Italian, well, I have family still there. Um, huh. And I'm, my parents, I mean, I, they spoke some Italian in the house when they didn't want us to understand. It was very important to them that we became what we called Medigan, which then I realized <laughs> meant American. I'm like, um, but they were very nervous about people knowing that we were Italian, like you could mistake it with a nose like this. We, we all have really big noses. My mother says we get more oxygen than anyone else in the room, which is probably true. But uh, <laughs> so I didn't really, um, I didn't really talk to my, and the other thing is those relatives who are there now have, have passed. So I couldn't really consult them, but I did find some grandparents 
of grandparents to talk to about some of the fact questions I had in the book. For example, we're talking about the historical perspective, but it is fiction. So it's the story of a young girl and how she chooses between two men and also how she comes of age and gets her identity and what happens in her family. So to center it, I actually thought about like, this is embarrassing to talk about, but not really, which is when she gets her first bra. I mean, I gave her my experience, which was I was kind of a tomboy. I wasn't about to get a bra. And then all the mean girls came up to me in school and said, you need a bra. And I was like, Wah. and so, so then I had to go find out how you actually got a bra in 1930s Italy. And I found somebody who said her grandmother was still alive and alive then and basically got the information. But you, you're always making, for me, you're making, whether it is a thriller that I wrote before or historical fiction that I'm writing now, you have to reduce it in size. You have to make it understandable. And that's true, especially of something like World War II, because the scope is so large. And when you start to talk about the numbers of people who were killed eventually by Nazis, one is enough. One is too many. You have to understand the meaning of one person. And in my thrillers before, I always wrote about one murder. I'm not one of these people where the yeah. bodies pile up. It's not slasher time. I don't do that. I want to understand, because murder has a, a, a gravamen. It is, it is a serious moment. It is, a, and it has victims and it has families of victims and ripple effects. Anyone who's the victim of crime knows that. This is just a war crime. It's really not different to my way of thinking, except that to, to end this point, when I was doing the research, one of the trips I made to Rome was on the 75th anniversary of this incident that takes place. It is sort of the centerpiece of the novel. So I was went to memorial services with um, survivors and their families. So I was very aware of my obligation to tell their story factually, to, to ground it in fact, and to make sure like double and triple and quadruple check everything. Everything in this book is rock solid, just in honor of the people who were lost. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, some, that's something that I think all three or, well, I guess four library staff members read the book and, and all of us were impressed with the, with the level of attention to detail and how factually, you know, how, but I think, I mean, it, it, it does, is some of that accumulated over time? I mean, because you wanted to write it for so long and was reading about this history kind of a hobby for you over time or? It kind of was, and I was kind of immersed in it. Then of course, when I finally said to write it, then I remind myself all of it all over again. And then, you know, as a sneak peek behind the scenes, when I first wrote it out, it was a thousand pages in manuscript and I've never done anything like that. Oh, wow. Wow, well, that's, <laughs> wow. That would have been, that would have been a lot of details, well, maybe too I, many. <laughs> yeah, like way too many. And I sent um, it to um, my editor and he called me at 930 at night, which is really unusual. Like they never do that. And I'm like, this, this can't be good. <laughs> and he's like, I really love the book. And he said a lot of nice things, but he said, I really think it needs to begin on page 318. And then I was like, as soon as he said that, I was like, oh my God, that is exactly right. And that, is that the edit you is that the one you mentioned in the acknowledgement the page? Oh, okay. I'm, I was wondering what that was. And yeah. what it was was it was I started the story from the older generation, and he said, "Let's start it younger and feather in the rest." And that's what I did. And I basically put oh. three, all the chapters out on the floor and said, "Because you know, when you write, it's partly what I'm saying about the education of a writer. That when you write a thriller, when you try to write anything, even the humorous pieces that I talk about, that are in books like." why, you know, why my third husband will be a dog or on my Facebook page every Sunday, come and see them. They're up there for free. <laughs> you know, you're writing an 800 word essay about something funny. You have to get to the point. And so when you're writing a thriller, you don't get to the point right away. You write it all out. And then when you edit, Hemingway says, write drunk, edit sober. And that's what I do. So <laughs> you're gonna really edit, edit. So then when I had that second crack at it, I said, okay, like, you, you have to really edit this down to bring it in the length that people want to read. And it's, it's not even a five, it's 450 pages. That's very, for me, I like books that are that length. Yeah. And so really take out everything that you don't need. And also because frankly, I have a lot of, I love my readers and I have a lot of respect for them. And people who read like me, um, if you have the time, you, you read in a gulp. Like, so, so, and I'm very aware 
that I, I don't want to say the same thing twice. I really hate that. Like, even as a lawyer, you know, you've established your fact and you move on. You don't need to reestablish it. Readers don't, at least as a reader, I don't like when I'm like, you just told me that, you told me that 20 pages ago. I was paying attention. I know. Don't <laughs> tell me again. So I took out a lot. I took out all that stuff. And I think it made it, it just made the whole so much better, which is really what matters. You know, not yeah. precious words. The story is what matters. So in, in the story, um, there's, there's a lot of points of view in the book. Um, something, something I was struck by is that, I mean, the book is about a lot of things, but it's one, one thing it's about is good and evil, right? Yes. And all the characters in the book kind of land, end, end up, they're all good people. They all end up on the side of good. And I was wondering, in, in any drafts of the book, did you, one, did you ever want to include the point of view of someone on the other side, I guess a Nazi or... You know, like maybe the point of view of like uh, Marco's Nazi friend or or like Carmine and Stefano or something. I mean, well, I, I <laughs> that would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think Marco stands in for that because. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right? Marco stands in for, I'm really interested in the flawed person. So no one is really pure good in this book. Even, even the anti-fascists, have a little bit of bad yeah. and right i'm not trying to give anything away but even marco who is a normal guy um is capable of evil and his best friend becomes a nazi he goes from having a best friend who's a jew and a best friend then to a best friend who's a nazi and so i was interested in the arc of his change because in a 20-year time period um you have changed. I've changed in 20 years. And I got to follow these families. I think I really like uh, Sandro's father, for example, who interestingly, as I said, you know, Jews being so assimilated in the society, they joined the fascist party because it wasn't anti-Semitic in, no, in, in the beginning. They joined the yeah. fascist party in the same number as Gentiles. So there were plenty of Jewish fascists. Mm. Now, what? Because there, there weren't Jewish Nazis. They were Jewish fascists. So imagine yeah. what happens when Mussolini, right, be, belatedly changes sides, decides to side with Hitler, starts enacting it, and you start to see in Massimo as the fascists take away his property, his profession, his, his fascist membership, he can't even believe it. And ultimately his Italian citizenship, he'd gone from being an Italian Jew to being able to be Neither, basically, Italian Jewish fascist. And I wanted to explore that because ultimately this novel is about identity too. You know, like Marco says, yeah. Marco, the one who's fascist, am I my uniform? That's what you see of me. Am I what I wear? Um, he gets used to, he has a brother who's a priest. Is he his casa? Um, he has a friend who's a Nazi. Is he his uniform? And, and when, when Massimo gets so much taken from him, he isn't sure who he is. If you take from him, lawyer, fascist, Italian. You know, he's a guy who doesn't want his daughter to marry somebody who's not Jewish and then doesn't want her to marry somebody who's not Italian. And you start to really start to question, I hope, what these boundaries are for. Yeah, it's... Right. It's wild that 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 he, you know, like reading the book and him sticking around as as everything is stripped away, and uh, you know, it's it's very heartbreaking. And it's right. it's funny that so many people stayed. I mean, I forget what you said at the end of the book, but eight thousand Jews were in, in well, you know, in, in really Rome or something to, at that time. First off, I really wanted to make clear that staying was not unreasonable. At, all the Jews and I should say, Jews and Romans who were Gentile in Rome believed that they would be inviolate. First, because of St. Peter's. No one, if you read the history at the time, it was very clear that nobody thought Rome would get bombed. Because yeah. of that. in the end, as it was, after Italy surrendered and couldn't decide how to join and which side to make peace with and when to make the peace, it ended up being bombed by both sides. It was bombed by the Nazis and it was bombed by the allies, which is incredible. So there was that. 
Also, the thing that, that they were right in believing that they should stay is that Jews from all over Europe were fleeing to Italy because it was viewed as a place that was friendly to Jews. And also that, you know, they were so protected there. And so it wasn't really so crazy to stay. It wasn't naive or wrong. And I don't like, I don't like when people judge other people. You know, it's like the Jews in Rome are as old as Rome. So, yeah. right, I understand why they didn't want to go. And in the end, I won't, I won't give it away, but the decision, and as you know, because I think I told some really true life heroic stories that there is Monsignor O'Flaherty, a real life guy who was called yeah. the Pernell of the Vatican, right? And he dresses in all kinds of costumes and runs around Rome trying to save Jews and hides them in the Vatican in some yeah. 700 apartments in the Vatican. Um, also, there's an incredible story, I don't want to reveal it all, but of a, a Catholic hospital in Rome that saves Jewish patients through an incredible ruse that is so relevant today. Uh, and it was so cool to uncover that stuff. So Italy and Rome presents a really unique, I think, story that it, to this literature that really was deserved to be told and needed to be told. And I was really, really honored you know, to tell it. That's why when Carol's review came in, I was like, oh my God, thank God. You know, <laughs> she gets it, like she gets it. Okay, so even even in the darkest moments of the book and um, characters, I like how characters' thoughts, instead of kind of dwelling on what's not going right, they tend to turn to their love for one another. There's a quote at the end of the book, war was eternal, but so was peace. Death was eternal, but so was life. Darkness was eternal, but so was light. Hate was eternal, but above all, so was love. At what point in the writing did this book become a novel about love right that is such a great question and the if, the funny thing is i cried when i wrote that i, I bet yeah because I, I mean especially coming at the so end hard. like that i mean <laughs> i didn't have any outline i never write with an outline so i gave myself this impossible job of a woman who's in love with two guys who are her best friends it, it's not a book about competition like they love each other so in a way it's no win because she knows if she chooses one she's going to lose the other even the guys know, God, I don't want to, if I have to lose her, I'm happy to lose her to her, but I don't want to. And it's about, so it's about love that is friendship. It's about the love that is romantic love. It's about the love of family for each other. It's about the love between people who are different. The Terizzi family, which is Marco's family, the Gentile family, always stands beside the Simone family, the Jewish family. At risk of their own life, they take care of them. They look out for them they will do anything for each other. And so that love is really what abides. And when I sort of got through it and it, you know, you just work yourself along and you go, what would logically happen next? What would these characters do? And I learned that writing, this was no different from writing a thriller. It's all the same narrative flow that when I got to that point, I said, this, this is really about love. And it really came together in that part. And then it, when I chose the, um, the, the quote at the beginning, because, you know, I've been collecting these quotes for so long and you try to choose one that's going to really epitomize the beginning, like the whole kind of thing. Anyway, yeah, just, I, I bookmarked some of those quotes. In the, in the book. that, yeah. um, it was the quote, love conquers all things. Now, mm. when I had that and put it in, I thought, you know, Lisa, that's, that's going to sound kind of simplistic. Like you're sounding a little bit like a greeting card now, like you got to need better, you know, English major, more obscure stuff. But I kept coming back to it. And I thought you really don't. And I remembered a wonderful quote, I'll paraphrase it by um, Primo Levi, who I mentioned before. Like he has a lot to teach us, right? He lived through a Holocaust. And he said this, you start to, he said, well, be careful when you start to think that someone is different from you, because soon you will think they're other than you. And as soon as you think they're other than you, you will think that they are less than you. And when you think that they are less than you, in the end will be a camp. And when I wrote, <laughs> I would, that gave me goosebumps. I was like, whoa, because that's what addresses what's really hard. That addresses, you know, it's easy to look back on the Holocaust now. So, oh, it's how this never should have happened. How did this happen? But it really speaks to slow it down, tell it in real time. What happened to the Jews in Italy was a death by a thousand cuts. And it was all done under the auspices of law. It was 
it was legalized horror. Yeah. And that's a really interesting thing because that's what turns the idea of law and justice on its head. And that's apropos my point about how justice gets warped in wartime or in times when we feel unsafe because it's human made and human beings will always make mistakes. And as Marco says, we'll always believe in the wrong thing. This will happen again and again because people will believe in the wrong thing. But you can't forget that there's still people. And that's the approach I had to the book. So I didn't judge these characters even as they went astray. Let's face it, a whole country went astray. Plenty of countries went astray. A whole world went astray and then righted itself until it gets off kilter again. And that's the point. Um, so I, I want to ask you about other novels about the Italian, Italian experience in World War II. Are there any other... Are there any other World War II Italian novels that helped inspire Eternal? You, I, I think you mentioned a couple. Yeah, I, the, I or, really El, felt, Elisabetta I feel, does. I feel like there's an unaccountable dearth of them. I feel like there are very few. So there's The Garden of the Finzi Cantini by Barzini, which was written a long time ago, and he was, a, you know, an observer lived in that time. Uh, was written about the north of Italy. Uh, there's been some novels set in Italy about World War II in Italy, um, Mark Sullivan's Under a Sheltering Sky. The more, uh, and also more Italian by Elsa Morante wrote history, which is partly about this time period. But I think there is really not very much. And there certainly isn't in popular American fiction about what happened to the Jews of Rome. That's not, yeah. written. that has not been written yet. I really feel that if I can just say, Eternal is definitive on that subject. It's just this. Thank yeah. you. I'm very proud of it. it. It's it seems like I mean it's such an important thing. I mean, well, it's, um, it's a little in the attention must be paid category. Not because it's me, not because it's my novel, but because of the subject matter that it brings to light. Oh, what about what about nonfiction books on the subject? Any well, anything I think in some non? There's nonfiction on it that was really helpful, and I quoted it in the back of the book. Um, there's a um, Alexander Stiele's Benevolence and Betrayal. There's a wonderful trio of books by a guy named Richard Katz. This is all in the back of the book. Um, one is Black Sabbath, he's deceased now, but a wonderful account of this episode. Um, there's also uh, Beneath His Windows by, I think her first name is Susan Zuccotti, an expert. And of course the expert who guided me because when I was finished this manuscript, I had read this work about a guy named Stan Pogliese, who's a professor at Hofstra and like the expert in Italian Jewry. And I said, listen, I'm, you know, obviously I've read you, your work informed my, my research. Would you mind reading this manuscript in it? Is there anything, would you fact check it for me? I mean, nothing can be wrong in this. And he said, I'd be happy to, and he did. And we've become great friends. And he said, I got one thing wrong, which was a, streets, a street name that had changed. <laughs> But well, that's not a that's not a big deal. Not not to me anyway. No, I was proud of myself. To someone, it's probably a big deal. Listen, you know, you don't get to be look. People who love libraries. We're book nerds, and you don't get to be a book nerd without doing your homework. And I did my homework. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so I have I have a couple questions about Philip Roth and his influence on you. That's that you you mentioned him in the acknowledgement acknowledgements page of the book. Picture. Go ahead. Uh, oh, do you have a do you I have, have, the have the picture? I have a picture. Because when I took this class, that, that was, picture is so uh, to me that I, I think that picture is I really thought that was the best picture I've seen of Philip Roth. But I think maybe it was the story, you, you know, so the, the, the story and the promotional materials that, that uh, you know, the, that explained the picture. That. But well, I was in this class. It was a year long seminar. Only 15 kids were in it. And of course, every week we read a different book and he would you know, he would assign it. And he you shows him lecturing. He never did anything but lecture. He sat there completely composed. He never got up. He never talked with his hands. He never really addressed us. This is all fine. I'm not complaining. I'm just going, I want to set the scene for you a little. And so it was like taking uh, physics from Einstein because basically what he did was sort of take a novel. You read the novel, you go in and go, now here's what makes this novel great. Classics. Here's what makes this novel a classic. Madame Flaubert, anyone, Robert Musil, uh, I could go on and reduce it. Take a look at this chapter. Now let's look at this paragraph. Now let's look at the sentence. Now let's look at this verb. 
right from the macro to the micro, take it down. And that's all he did. And that's everything he did. And I think it was an unbelievable education. And it was a year long course. Yeah. So imagine, you know, that many weeks of just read a great novel and listen to someone explain to you what makes a great novel. Did it change the way you, it changed the way you think of, I mean, did it change the way you thought when you read novels after that? Yes. And it changed the way I read. It changed, every, it changed, it, yeah, it educated me. Let's hear it for teachers. I mean, to me, what's so amazing, the takeaway for me is that teachers are so amazing. I'm a, I am a product of public education and, and public libraries. And I, I've always felt teachers have an enormous impact. Sadly, they've passed, but after my first books was out 30 years ago, I would go to lunch with my high school English teachers, Miss Cobb and Miss Haas, and they would tear me apart. And they were harder than the New York Times. <laughs> it was amazing. But I am, um, so I, teachers mean so much to me. And I think we all acknowledge the effect they have. But to ha here's a teacher. Okay, he happens to be a little famous guy, but that doesn't really matter. In my context, he was a teacher. And 40 years later, had such an effect on me that I thought about what he taught me for 40 years, yeah. used it every day in my job, and finally said, that guy whose books you introduced me to, watch this. Not so another, another question about Roth. Uh, what, what's your favorite Philip Roth novel? And what, what is his, what is his right? Oh, there's a cat or a dog there's or something. A dog. There's, like, there's five dogs. <laughs> and, what, cat, so and, what, and what is, what is his writing? Like what? I think I wanted to ask what from his writing worked its way into eternal, but I think, but it sounds like that's not what worked its way in. What worked no. its way in is the way you think about books. Right. Because um, the thing you, about are you a fan of him as a writer? I'm just curious. Uh -huh. I mean, yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think, sure. And I, but the thing about eternal is, and this was a hard part for me because what he told me was voice. Like you have to write yeah. with an authentic voice. Now you're not writing about yourself, so you have to write in a character's voice. Now those characters may be an, some aspect of yourself for an emotional truth. So when you take a book like Portnoy's Complaint, which is controversial, but one of his, one of his biggest books certainly, um, yeah. that's a very voicey book. It's written in this young man's voice who's free of his mother and loves his mother, but also angry of his mother. And authenticity matters, truth matters. So that's yeah. the lesson that I take from Roth. So when I write Eternal, interestingly, for the first time, I can't write in a contemporary voice. Every single one yeah. of my novels is in a contemporary voice. Well, I talk like this, I'm from South Philly. I live outside of Philadelphia. Uh, my characters have to vary their voices in a contemporary novel. But this one I had to change, there's no contractions, so that it all had to be of a piece. And I'm such a control freak that I was like, I love my publisher. I was like, okay, guys, I, I want to see this cover. And I wanted to hear that. I wanted to feel like paper. Uh, yeah. I, wanted to, I want to see the font. I want the font to look a little archaic. I want- Yeah, and it does too. Yeah. Not, I know, they're yeah. great. I said, everything, when you, and when you read the period fiction of the time, like Elsa Morante, you know, you, they have expressions. I've used this before, but they say, um, instead of gossip, they say people talk behind their hands. And I kind of love that expression. You, it's a visual. And also Italians do a lot of gesturing, as you know, instead of uh, words. So, you know, it's quiet or I don't care or you know what that means. So yeah. my point is that all of that had to be authentic in the same way you couldn't have a Corvette drive through. You can't have her say something like, I know, right? Yeah. Because that's how yeah. people talk now, right? <laughs> can't do that. So that was a really tough one for me because, but then I said, well, just find Elizabeth's truth and be her. And that made it, and that was the challenge, but it was also great, great, great fun. And one, one more question about Roth. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep hammering Roth forever, I, like I guess. It. But <laughs> um, So question is, uh, did you ever imagine when you were writing Eternal, did you imagine the book as the subject of Roth's, uh, you know, seminar on literature of the Holocaust? What all do you think time. you would have said about that? Oh, you did. That's great. I, oh, I, thought, I thought you might. What, what do you think you would have said about it? 
I think, well, first off, let I just say, because I have to brag that I got an A from Philip Roth, both semesters, <laughs> both semesters, baby. That's awesome. <laughs> and of course, like, I can't even find those papers anymore, because you know how you are. He probably didn't them. give many A's either. He's a serious guy. He, so. Oh, he was a very serious guy. I mean, he had us call him Mr. Roth, which that's, I'm fine with pretty that. pretty serious, yeah. Well, we did that then. It was like the 70s, they were like, call me Ellen, you know. I don't think he knew any of our names. He never tried. It wasn't about, there were no office hours. I, I understand. I did ask his permission to take that picture. Um, yeah. I said, Listen, I'm on the yearbook staff. You know, can I do this? Because you are like legit professor. And he's like, yes. He was very formal. The only word I ever said to him was they, there was a class party that somebody had. It was a, a friend of his who invited us. So you're, so then I was right next to him at one point. And I was like, what are you going to say? And then there, these people had a cat. So the cat uh, walked by and I said something like, I, that's a nice cat. Do you like cats? And he's like, yes, I like cats. <laughs> and like, this is your chance to talk to one of the greatest, you know, minds in American literature. And you're like, oh, do you like cats? Do you like dogs? Uh, that was all I said to Philip Roth. So don't eat, because sometimes people have said, you know, did you keep up your correspondence? There was no correspondence. There's no not, there's not anything. Yeah. There's only people and teacher. But I felt, I felt that, um, and I went back to teach at Penn Law School. I taught a course called Justice and Fiction as an adjunct law professor. And that was inspired by him too. I felt that, you know, I, it's sad that he's passed because I wish that he would know that he had such an influence on me, even later, that it's not, it's not gone. Nobody forgets. Yeah. Nobody forgets the things you said in class. Teachers should know that right now. Just like I said to you as a librarian, you know, you don't get to see the people walking over the threshold in the library. You really don't know what goes on in their house, whether yeah. they're beloved or they're slapped, whether they're given books to read or they're in the, have invectives hurled at them. You just don't know that. So I love to talk at libraries because I love to say, I'm the person who got a lot of love at home, but there was no library. There were no books. There was nobody. My mother would always say, why stop reading? It will ruin your eyes. Uh, and she <laughs> loved me. She was like, go out and play. I'm like, but I just want to read. I am playing. This is playing. Watch. <laughs> and I never got over it. And it was, really wasn't until I got to a library that I felt that here's my tribe, you know, and we got on great from then on. So it's the same notion. Like teachers should know that they're beloved and their influence is felt forever. And that's the same thing to librarians. It's a really true love. It's actually love. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, feel it, Thomas. Um, I feel it. Um, so how, how long after that seminar with Philip Roth, how long after that until you started writing in earnest? I mean, until you, right. until you kind of moved toward, I, I, we, we found, or Carol found actually a, a 2014 New York Times piece that you wrote about Roth's class where you said like in those days I I dreamed of marrying what I wanted not becoming what I wanted I wanted to some or I dreamed I would someday write but I doubted it right. so how long after that did you start to write and, yeah. and what was the beginning like for you first of we didn't have any money in my family so there was no question that I wasn't going to be a writer because I didn't even know how you made money at that and I had school loans. In fact, I graduated college a year early only because I couldn't pay for the fourth year. Mm. So I said to myself, you, you're good in English, go to law school. And yeah. you're interested in law, you watch Perry Mason. It was like that. And I, and, but I, I did feel, I still thought it was a, a really interesting and important job. And I was a trial lawyer. So I did that. And it really wasn't until my first divorce Sounds so impressive, doesn't it? The truth doesn't always have a, it's true, but it isn't always impressive. That I realized um, my daughter was born and I was like, wow, I love being a trial lawyer, but this isn't going to work with being a new mom. And I secretly always wanted to write and now I'm broke. So why don't I quit my job and try to become a writer? At that point, there was a guy named John Grisham about whom you may have heard. And he was writing a lot of legal thrillers with all men in the lead. And I was like, well, I, why are there so few women main characters in crime fiction? Why don't I write that? And they turn out to be Italian American and they turn out to be from South Philly and they talk a lot <laughs> like this. And uh, there I was off and running. I had five years of rejection though. I will tell you my, 
My mm. favorite rejection letter was from an agent who said, we don't have time to take any more clients. And if we did, we wouldn't take you. <laughs> harsh. <laughs> Way harsh. Yeah, it's pretty oh, harsh. God. I know. Yeah, and you John, know like as as a as a little kid, so my, my dad is a lawyer and John Grisham was my favorite as a little kid for, for some reason, like like 10 year old me reading reading the firm and lawyers are superheroes or whatever. Right. Um it was <laughs> it was pretty, you know, but but what what do you think what is it about being a lawyer that makes for good writers? Is there some training in law school or is it just is it just hammering out legal briefs or something that uh I think we get a little bit of the um I think in law school they do teach you a little bit to take a set of facts and tell a point of view so if you're standing in front of a jury you're not going to tell them all the facts essentially you are telling them you're telling them a story in a point of view yeah you're building so, a narrative yeah you, for, exactly you, you're building a narrative well said yeah thank you Travis and it's no <laughs> different from what I do now I think a lot of it I learned in high school. Um, I don't think you have to go to any special school though to be a writer and people are thinking about writing. I really encourage them because it's really, there, there's no right way to do it, no wrong way. You just get your story down and then you get it good. So I forget, now I forget the question. Oh, uh, what, what, makes, what makes lawyers good writers? I think, oh. uh, I think you pretty much got it there. But I do think a little of this, that I think for me, I love what I loved about being a lawyer, and I really did love it. I'm not one of these lawyers that hated it, although everyone's allowed to have their feeling, but I just didn't think it would work with my personal life being a single mom as a litigator. I didn't, yeah. day one, I just wouldn't work. I, 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 I want, anyway, I stayed home and went broke. But finally, in six years, got a job and had to pay back a mountain of debt. But um, I forget again. <laughs> Oh, I know. But what I loved about my job was I felt like there was a justice to it, that there was, you could do justice. And that's when this story came to me when I started to understand what had happened in Rome and see what true life happened, that I was like, where is the justice in this? You can't bring the bad guys to jail or you can't, the victims are gone. All you can do is tell the story. And at one point, I will tell you, I met a historian, not, not the one I mentioned earlier, not Stan Pugliese, but another one who I will not name. And I said to him, why was there no, no Nuremberg about this? Because this was a war crime. Like, this was a war crime. And he said, um, well, nobody wanted another Nuremberg. Mm. And I was like, I did. I do. <laughs> like, you don't, get, you don't get away with this. You can't get away yeah. with it. You can't get away with murder. So I thought, what do I, what can I do? I can tell the story. So in a way, I think people, I think people like stories about right and wrong and where it's not so clear and they can all picture what would I be like? I mean, I think eternal is like that in spades. You go, what would I have done in this situation? What would Elizabeth to do? What should she do? And do I understand why people made the right choices or the wrong ones? That's the stuff of great fiction, great drama. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I opened up the chat. I'm trying to see if oh, there's well, a. I'm not having fun. <laughs> but uh, all right, I have I have a few more. I have a few questions about. I want to talk about your daughter, the writer who has her who has her first book out, uh, uh, the Ghost of Harvard, published. Right. Was that published this year? Last year? It was published um, in March. In March. Oh, in March. Okay. Right. Um, Give me a paper back in so June. What I, what, my, what my question is, is, uh, do you, do you, uh, so you, you've also, you co-author a column together. You've co-authored memoirs together. Uh, does your daughter act as a first reader for you? And do you act as a first reader for her? And <laughs> this is a long question, but, and, oh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna, I mean, it, I, I, I was wondering if that could work because you, you know, I'm not First sure if off, tough love, love would work in that situation. <laughs> First off, I love her. First off, she's great. I was so proud of her to publish Ghosts of Harvard, her debut. Um, it, it's an amazing book and it's just an amazingly immersive story. It's a story about a woman who uh, goes to Harvard in the wake of her brother's or older brother's suicide there on campus. And uh, he was really a genius, but he was also schizophrenic and he started to hear voices. And when she's there, she starts to hear voices and she wonders if she is 
uh, somehow starting to develop schizophrenia herself or is something mm. else going on? It was really very well reviewed and it did really great. So I'm so, so proud of her. And uh, so, yeah, we have a little family of two writers here. That's, <laughs> that's her in the house. That's her dog. You know, they're, the dogs are always making... Oh. <laughs> I know it's like please we try to lock them down but there's one that's free um, yeah my, my dogs are like driving around in the trunk of my wife's uh ramp four <laughs> right now so they don't so they don't bark and cause a bunch of chaos so. No, um so no we are not each other's first reader though and I think she says it best because she says I I have an editor but I only have one mom and that's good yeah. like um and I, I think also now I, with Fraternal, she was super helpful to me because after my editor had it, some point before I handed it in, finally I said, you know, you want to take a look at this? I'd love to hear what you think. And she had yeah. some really good notes, like really good notes. Huh. And I was like, oh, baby girl, <laughs> coming through for mommy. I really appreciated it. So it's really wonderful. But, you know, look, I'm a single mom. We've been together in the pandemic. She's, she's been, she's about to go back. We got each other through this, and that's what family is for. We just get each other through this really difficult time. I feel so yeah. much, but I'm very proud oh. of her. <laughs> so, what, what's your what's your advice to a writer at, at the early stages of her career, like Francesca, or even or even earlier, like someone someone like you sitting at that in that seminar with Philip Roth? What, what's your advice to a young writer? Well, look, my advice is the same to whatever age writer. Because, you know, here I am at my age, which is 65, uh, writing something I haven't really written before, certainly a bigger topic, a bigger scope. It's a big book. It's about a big love. It's writ large, everything I've done before, only bigger. Uh, so that to a certain extent was a challenge. And I said, why not you? Like, try. So the bottom line is, that's what I think everybody should say to themselves that regardless of what age you are, whether you're just starting out or it's a second career or it's a third career, or it's just, you've always wanted to write a book. You really can, and you really should try. Um, you know, I have writing maxims that I have gotten from reading books about fiction, like Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, give yourself permission to write, a, as she says, a shitty first draft. That's really yeah. good writing advice because the main thing with lawyer, lawyers, uh, authors, is, especially if I may say women, is we tend to get in our own way. We aren't really socialized to take risk well. We don't want to mess up. So then you get perfectionistic and then it's not good enough and then you can't write it and so you're paralyzed. So the best thing to do is to get it down. Uh, this great slogan, I think my daughter actually thought of it, Francesca's get it down, then get it good. Or the Hemingway, mm -hmm. write drunk, edit sober. I say that to people who have kids who want to write. You know, let your kid write anything. Let them read anything. Don't get in their way. Let them express and get used to expressing and being unafraid about expressing. You can always shape it into a story. You'll take out what doesn't need to be there. But it initially, Nora Roberts is the one who says you can't edit a blank page. That's absolutely right. Yeah. The advice, um, the real advice is just do it, which is what I said to myself from, from Nike. <laughs> oh, also, give yourself a word count. I have a word count. My word count is 2,000 words a day. It's yeah. just a job. You go, well, it is a job. You go to your job and you do it. No matter what, you do 2,000 words a day. Some days, uh, I start at nine. Some days that will take me till six o'clock and I feel like a star. Other days it will take me till 11. That doesn't matter. It take, some days it takes till three in the morning. Doesn't have to be good words. It just says it'd be two thousand. That's about a chapter in my world. And yeah, is that about ten page, ten book pages seven, or something? Yeah, yeah. And so eventually you get that down bit by bit, and you um manage to tell the story. Yeah. So I, I asked you at the beginning, what makes a book a masterpiece? Now I want to ask you, what? How do you make a number one bestseller? <laughs> is it is it just is it just keeping keeping readers' eyes on the page? Do you think? You know, um, I, I I wish I knew because my only way I did it was over thirty years. <laughs> so I built my career very slowly. Um, you know, each time there goes Francesca, I got more and more. <laughs> my readership grew bit by bit by bit, and I feel like I earned that um, every step of the way. 
So certainly that's not the only way to do it, but that is the way I did it. And I feel really lucky in that because when it finally got to a number one bestseller, which was after Anna, um, I thought, well, I thought, wow, <laughs> all it took was your whole life. <laughs> That's all right, because right, it's a wonderful job. And I know I'm a count your blessings person. I just always have been. I have a great dog. <coughs> He's healthy. I'm healthy. This is the whole family. The dogs are healthy. The cats are healthy. And uh, I know how lucky I am to be able to have a life in books. I love books. I'm right to my left here is I'll show you real quick. That's the messy part of the house, but there's oh, nice. <laughs> room of this that's house. that's uh, the great thing about Zoom is you just have to keep that one wall I relatively know, clean. Wall, man. I'm not screwing up the wall. <laughs> um, let's see. So I, I have a, a few more questions, uh, a couple of questions from Carol, and then I want to get to the chat. Um, okay. So these are these are more. Um, well, I'll just I'll just read them. What's your favorite non what's your favorite non reading or writing activity? Needlepoint. Needlepoint. Okay. Enough said. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> and uh, riding you, horse. You uh, so you're great about boosting other authors in their books. What other authors are you friends with and how do they help you become a better writer? Who never thought about that. Well, first of all, I think I become a better writer the more I read. If you are thinking yeah. about writing, you should read. Stephen King says that, somebody smarter than me. You should read and read and read and read. You'll learn. But can I tell you something, the secret thing that you'll learn? You'll learn that there's a lot of books out there that aren't that great. Is that yeah. okay to say? You'll, you'll read okay a book. Well, it's true. You'll be reading and we go, this isn't so great. I could do this. As long as you have that, that's what I remember. I, I love the title of Mindy Kaling's book, Why Not Me? Why not you? <laughs> it's not rocket science and there's no it's i went to law school to become a lawyer because you had to there's no school you have to go to to become a writer and so that's a really important thing to keep in mind so read a lot you'll learn from everybody you read that's yeah, it's funny what? about about books and you know good books versus bad books or, or whatever mm -hmm. i uh i've been ordering books for the library for years or you know many years and all I do is read book reviews all the time, you know, like in, you know, in the, in the library journal or whatever, and I can tell what book is going to be good. And the only, and the only books I order are the good ones and I like them all. It's weird, but I used to read horrible books, but, but I've just been doing it for so long. I can just tell which ones are going to be good. So I don't know. How can you tell? Wait, I'm going to text Francesca to get the dog out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's the one of <laughs> I you thank you, author Francesca Saratella, author of Birds of Here, you can want to say hi. Real this is well, hey, I <laughs> hi, Poppy. <laughs> what, what's your name? Sorry, this is Francesca. This is Travis. Hey, Travis. Sorry that hi, Francesca. Congratulations on the book. Mom. And uh, honestly, and I, I don't, I don't blame you for not using your mom later. as a first reader. I think that would. This is all <laughs> about me. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry about that. I forget the question. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> oh, you! I was so, asking oh, you, how can you tell it's good? How can I tell it's good? I, I think it's just, I can, I, I can tell, I think it's the summary of the, of the plot, maybe. I, I don't, I don't know, but I, I can just, I can just tell almost instantly. It's kind of strange. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. No, um, you know what? I, I must tell you, I get that. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know why it is. I think it's just from reading book reviews for years and years. So. I get that. Um, so Elsa Betta gets so much pleasure from her two cats in the novel. Pets like your like your dog there are important or <laughs> seem important to you too. Do you always include pets in your books? Well, I do. See, look, everything everything happens for a reason. In the novel, as much as I love dogs and cats, because I have both. You have to, I have chickens too. There's no chickens in it. You have to, um, it's there for a reason. Marco has a wonderful family, very close knit, although they have their agita, right? That's, that's Italian for family crap. Uh, Sandra has a really good family structure too. Elisabetta is not so lucky. She has a father who uh, is alcoholic. She has a mother who is not as attentive as she should be. 
And so Elizabeth, is, and I love in her the strength. I'm sort of known for strong women characters because I love the strength in all of us, my daughter, my friends, my mom. And so Elizabeth just does what she has to get done. And without a lot of fanfare and without everybody applauding, she's a very loving person. So, but the sad thing is she has a lot of love to give, but not a great family. Well, it makes sense for her to have a cat. She's yeah. got a cat. And look, I live alone. Francesca's going to back to New York now the pandemic's over. Uh, I have a lot of dogs because nobody can stop me. <laughs> I kind of like it. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. And I really, I think I gave the line to, I gave the line to Elizabeth. I let her say, love fills the heart, whether it's given or whether it's received. Now that's kind of true. Now dogs love you back and they can give you a lot of love. We know that. Cats, not so much. My cats are not super loving. I've had two 13 year old cats and they look at me like they never met me before every time I feed them. I'm like, do you know me? Do you know me? I'm the only one in your life. There's no one else in your life, but still. So cats are funny, but her cats are, her cats serve a purpose narratively, believe it or not. All right. I, I, I want to get a, I want, I want to get, I want to get to a few chat questions. Okay. Um, but before we wrap up so so that we can talk directly to the readers here but let me uh i'd love to do let that let me just let me just scroll back because i've been i've been overly talkative so oh, yeah, this um, is great. do you do you have do you have plans to write another historical novel yep i'm oh, you do. I'm great well i regard this as sort of a there's there's i i've written domestic thrillers this is kind of a domestic historic thriller right I'm writing a domestic thriller next. And then if that'll write another historic, and then I'm going to get in there somewhere, a Rosado and Associates, because I missed, I missed those girls. I missed that series family that I have. Yeah. Um, I think we covered this one. Do you have cover, do you have input on the cover design? The nostalgic cover of Eternal oh, makes the book so appealing. Little but... <laughs> That's, that's a very nice way to put it. I'm just a total control freak. And luckily my yeah. <laughs> platinum is just hugely cooperative. Uh, someone says, this is Marianne, the info about the Italian Jewish community being the oldest in civilization. Is that because so many other Jewish people did not have a permanent home? Does that make sense? No, I, it goes, um, no, it goes back in time from the time of the Romans. I mean, it goes back 2000 years. Yeah, it's, it's because um, it's, they're not my, they're not migrants from anywhere else. There was a point when uh, there were original R Roman Jews, and there were also Jews who were brought to Rome as slaves uh, from the sacking of the temple, and that is actually covered in the book. I mention it so that you'll know what is, you know, a little bit of the history there, but. It's a remarkable fact to me. And when you walk through it, you can see, in fact, this should, I should say this, on my website, uh, you know, so when I did the research for this, I was so kind of swept away that I started recording videos about it. And I put all those videos, I've been on Facebook on Tuesday nights, I know some people have joined me, <laughs> showing those videos, because so like, why not? I mean, why not let them see it? Now they're all housed on my website, along with what we did oh, cool. for the first time ever. I know this is the best, because I, I can say it's great, because it's not my idea. It was my best friend, Laura's. It's an um, interactive map of the scenes in Eternal. So you can go to where the scene is, like the Jewish ghetto, see where it's located. And we took pictures like in front of uh, what would have been Elizabetta's house and what would have been Marco's house in Tiber Island. Elizabetta lives in Trastevere, which is sort of the artsy neighborhood. And Sandra lives in the ghetto. And you can see how they're all close to each other. And all of that stuff, there are book, and thank you to Carol for saying it's a great book club read. I really think it is. Uh, we're doing an initiative for book clubs. So those who can <laughs> send in the picture, we will choose 25 book clubs to go to a Zoom meeting with. So they should look that up. But there's book club materials, questions, my mother's ravioli recipe. I mean, because there's so much to this time period that you couldn't put in a book that is sort of behind the book and makes a really nice companion piece to people who want to know more about the Jews of Rome. They can look that up on my website. It's all there. It's just mentioned in the book and enough to so you need to know in the book, but um, it's fully explicated on the website. Cool. 
Thank you. Um, so this is a this is a great question from Facebook. Uh, which is easier to write, the beginning or the end of a book? Oh my God, <laughs> nothing in a book is easy to write. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. I love doing it, and I feel really lucky. But you know, it's hard, man, because you first draft is hard because you don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's kind of good a little bit because the reader doesn't know what's going to happen. And it was really interesting with respect to historical fiction because there's some limits of history. But you know, so you kind of know who wins World War II. Well, that you know. But these are fiction, these are fictional people. And the cool and interesting thing about, think about us. Think about us in the pandemic. Last March, we didn't know we were in a pan, we were entering a pandemic. We were people who were going to be in a historical event of global proportions. My daughter comes home. She's got a book that's going to come out. They're going, they might not be able to print books. There is no, you're like, what? Like <laughs> what, right? So when you are living through history, you don't know it. And I was like, that is exactly the lesson of eternal. They were living through a period yeah. that ended up being cataclysmic for war and the world, but they didn't know it. So I forget what that was the answer to, but I'm sure that was a compelling answer to an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Great answer. Whatever okay. I, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> someone, someone wants to see a needlepoint project. Do you have one in your lap right now? <laughs> Wait a minute. I only have 400. Hold on. Are you ready? Be ready. During the pandemic, I did more pillows than I ever did. <laughs> wow, that is that is impressive. How good this is. It's a big pillow too. Really? Wow. This in needlepoint, we call this a big ass pillow, baby. No, I love it. It matches my living room and I'm so proud of it. I love yeah, that's great. I'm glad I asked. That's a, that's that, a... be, is that weird that I got up? Because I was so proud of it. But people who stitch <laughs> now understand whether you whether you need no, it. Yeah. And then, well, of course you get it. It takes you like a long time to make and then the dogs sit on it. So now there's dog hair on it, which is, oh, and here's, here's probably, that's probably some dog throw up. That's always a nice touch. Yeah, great. Welcome to my house. The elegant and the <laughs> profane all at once. So you were, what else you want me to show you? <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. Um, I well, so I, I think, I think uh, the, these are, there's a, there's a few questions like this, so it's it's actually a good point to kind of wrap up on. Okay. Um, but the questions are, what what's your favorite book? What are you reading now? What new books do you recommend? Thing is that too is that too much? The, no, the, I can the, talk about that. I don't have a really a favorite book per se, but I really um. Oh, what's your favorite book that you wrote? This one. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, this one, this one. Is, is, the new, is the new one, is the new one always your favorite? I'm like adjusting my jewelry on this camera. <laughs> I no, Well, yeah, actually it kind of is. I always think of yeah. that Billy Wilder quote. He says something like, I don't know, something about you try. Honestly, I like to joke around and entertain people, but I take the craft part really seriously. Like I'm an animal, you know what I'm saying? I'm crazy with it. I'm very, I was obsessed with Italy to write this book. And I will be obsessed with the next thing that I write. And um, so I get really involved. So the, I don't have a fa So my favorite book of my own is definitely this one. I also must say that I want to take a second to love the audio book. I, have, I always get audio book approval. For this audio book, I requested these uh, narrators. And they, Eduardo Bellarini and Cassandra Campbell, they're so amazing. For the first time, thank you, Amanda. The audiobook was amazing. I have listened to this audiobook twice. And that I can say that without bragging, because people who are audiobook fans know that it isn't bragging, it's a performance. And they brought these people to life twice. I've listened to my own audiobook. That's crazy. All right. Anyway, but I love all kinds of novels and I read them all. Uh, Harlan Coben, his new one, Win, I have. David Baldacci's coming out with a new one. I can't even wait. It's called Gambling Man. Um, I love historical fiction, so I really love Lisa Wingate, uh, Before We Were Yours. I love Mary Hall, uh, Martha Hall Kelly's Sunflower Sisters. I loved um, uh, Christina Baker Klein's The Exiles. I, Paula McLean has just come out with a new um, When the Stars Go Dark. She's writing 
went from historical to suspense instead of suspense to historical. I'll tell you what's also great. Chris Bajalian has something called coming historical novel called The Hour of the Witch, which is about an abusive wife in the Salem, Salem witch trials kind of thing, which was really fascinating and well done. Uh, Pam Jenoff has a book coming out called The Woman with the Blue Star. I read all the time, as you can tell. Wow. And I'm steeped, baby. I could take, I love it. <laughs> I could talk all night, as anybody who loves books can. Um, so yeah, I got stuff to read. There's stuff to read. Yeah, great. And follow me on yeah, I had I had Christina Baker Klein on to talk about the exiles. A oh, couple great! Of ago. A, yeah, she's great. great. And I make an enjoyable book. Yeah, totally. They should follow me on social media too because I recommend stuff that I think is great to to my readers. I I want them to be read great stuff. Yeah, and you're very active on social media too. And, I am I'm and entertaining. Got to got to got to my time. So I I like, <laughs> it. I like it especially being um with this pandemic. I my daughter said something so smart when she said, you know, some writers write to go within and others write to connect. And we we write to connect. That's true. That's why I miss coming out there. I mean, I've been to Ohio so many times for the library system and I hug everybody and I jump in their lap and they're like, get off me, Scott Alina. I'm like, no, I never will. I never will. <laughs> yeah, so, you, you, you've been to, did you, you've read at Cuyahoga before at, at Parma oh, or something? I've, I've read yeah. it a bunch of, well, I never read. I only read for well, you. We'll, I we'll, never, we'll have, we'll have you in, uh, to, in person next year, maybe. Let's do it. We're, let's do it. I'm vaccinated we're, now. We're, we're gonna, we're gonna have a big venue too. So it'll be nice. Oh, I love it. So. I would really love it. Yeah. Um, Okay. Oh, one, one more. You got time for one last question? From, I, I got from nothing, people. baby. What do you need? What do you, bring it on. <laughs> did, did you originally struggle with the ending of the book and did you write an alternate ending? Huh? Interesting question. I didn't struggle with it. You know, what, what happens when you write a book, what would logically happen next is it's almost organic because by the time you start, to, the characters reveal themselves to you as you're writing them. And that doesn't sound weird or magic. It's really more that they behave in consistent ways. And that's really, crazily enough, it's a lot like life. You are what you do. I mean, I believe that. And what you do changes over time and who you are changes over time. And in a novel, the thing that, uh, the thing that happened before affects the next thing. Briefly, I can explain it if you want me to by illustrating what happens in the first chapter of this novel. We're not giving anything away. In the first chapter of this novel, Elisabetta watches, is trying to decide who will be her first boyfriend. And she watches Marco thinking, he's going to be my first boyfriend. Look at him on that bicycle. He is so cool. I like him. And then Sandra comes up and kisses her. And she's like, why did he do that? Okay, <laughs> now that blows her mind. Now, the second chapter is Marco going, did I see Sandra kiss Marco? And later, the third chapter is Marco going, Sandra going, did I kiss Elisabetta? Like, so <laughs> then you just go along and I'm just rocking and rolling. I go, what happens next? At some point, the story concludes itself organically and naturally. So there's no alternative end. There's no other end that it can be. Um, I think I'm sort of known for having good endings. I'm a believer in a really strong ending. Um, did you get those, did you get those end chapters pretty much on the first crack at it or did I mean I'm, I'm just curious because the ending wrap it wrapped up so nicely thank you it really worked it worked no I just visualized them the last hundred pages right you're talking about that visualizing it's, what they would do yeah no yeah. it worked really well do, <laughs> and do you do you use that technique in in other books the short chapters bang 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 like that or is this no, the first time you're so nice I know it's really it depends on the book, but it really, depends on the book, yeah. and it's really the edit. Because the, the thing I forgot to say is when you, you tell your first draft and then you're done, then I become a happy person because I know I have a story. I do this for a living, like my bills, like, you know, you know what I mean? So I know, yeah. I know I have a story. Once I have that draft, then I'm the happiest person in the world because then I can just make it. I always say, get it down and get it good. I just say to each sentence, as I learned from Roth, justify yourself chapter justify yourself paragraph justify yourself sentence verb now if you're not justified you're out what happens is think really get compressed then and i also yeah. have a reader who reads in a goal i'm not going to bore you i'm not going to tell you if you read it 400 pages earlier i know you remember it 
people are smart they remember stuff so it came out it just worked i really think it just worked but a lot of that is the editing not the original draft yeah yeah cool but thank you, Travis. you're so kind for saying that i really <laughs> that i was proud of the way it turned out i was like damn this is working okay and it was important and it was serious and it had to be done right and all that stuff is factual all of it yeah yeah the i mean it it it's funny because it reads like it, i mean it's so so researched so gone over and i um but it's it's really really a successful uh a really successful job there thank you that's very kind of you to say that can you can't imagine how how happy they made i'm moving into your library did i mention that yet tell carol set up a cop <laughs> back room i hope you have well it. i'm yeah you can you can have my office i'll move to the basement <laughs> i like where you are now that looks great <laughs> yeah i'm 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 actually uh the, this whole time i've been home i'm I'm home recuperating from knee surgery. So oh, honey. I'm, I'm uh, doing I'm doing author visits on my front, you know, on my back porch, which is kind of great. It's fine for me. Very mellow. <laughs> it's, it's a very nice mood. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Well, that's that is that is all the questions that I've got for you tonight. Um, ooh. Uh, there <laughs> there's another question on Facebook, right. but they're, they're um, what, so what what were the what here here's the one last question yeah what were the what were the 300 pages that your editor told you to cut about <laughs> and <laughs> those 300 and pages. is there another book there <laughs> i wish i can't leave the world i know it's hard those 300 pages were really the beginning of the day Mar the day mussolini marches into rome in 1922 and it was sort of the story of massimo beppe and their story and Ludovico, uh, Elizabeth's father. So what I did was I lost a lot of stuff that I loved, but I did, but I said, what's really important? This is what I realized there, with this. You know that Marie Kondo came along and she was telling everybody how to clean. And she's like, yeah. take everything out of your closet and then put back in only what you need. And I was like, oh my, I would not do that to my closet because I don't care enough. But my book, I said, that's what I did to my book. I took that whole front end off and then I put in only what I needed with respect to those three characters. And that's what was out. But thank you uh, for the question. That's a really excellent question. Yep. Well, okay. Thank, well, Lisa, thank you, you very, so very great. much for visiting with us thank tonight. You, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you everyone Amanda. for, uh, for coming. Thank, thank you, Carol, you for the questions and Amanda. I miss you all. I want to get out there and collect. Really appreciate clothes. it. Thank you. We'll, we'll see you. We'll see you live and in person here sometime soon. Please.